Now, you don't want me to film you, though, right? Yeah. Okay, but tell the story then. You tell it, tell it Mary. Oh, oh that's that rocking. rocking chair. That was my grandmother's mother. And it was down in the cellar, and it real junky, all <coughs> poor and messed up. And we brought it, had it redone, so that the new leather on there, and I think it's probably over 100 years old, but I don't know for sure. And it was in, in, in a where? Base, in a cellar. Cellar in? Back East cellar, cellar, cellar. In Rome? Yeah, in Rome, New York, right. And My what was your... My grandmother lived with us. <coughs> but this was her mother's rocker. And what was your grandmother's mother's name? It was Mary Cat My grandmother was Mary Catello. I don't know what her maiden name, or her other name was, or her mother's name was. It was Grandma, Grandma Catello, Mary Catello is where I got it from, but it was her mother's. Wow. And I don't know what her mother's wow. name was. When was your grandma, Mary Catello, born? Well, she died in, when I was about, uh, let's see, she died in 46 or 45, so and she was 75. She was. So that was like 1870 when she was born, your no, grandmother? No, 19 something. I don't know, so, whatever you can figure it out. So she died in 1945 and she was 75 years old? Then yeah. she would have been born in 1870. Okay. And it was her mother's. It was her mother's, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it is over 100 years old. Yeah, it is over 100 years I told you. Now, Grandpa Joe, are you over 100 years old yet? Are you over 100 years old? 132. Really? Yeah. <clears throat> How many lies have you ever told in your life? Well, that's the second one. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> okay, I can think of something. I think I wrote about this a long time ago. The first car I remember my folks having was a Model A Ford. And I remember they had a uh, little crib or something that hooked on across the back seat where the back seats were. And I put the, they put me in there, I guess. And I remember waking up once and seeing lights like the city <coughs> and my mother was driving. And I fell asleep. I just got that little glimpse. But I think this is when her father died, and he was driving the Bayonne. And you know, cars were not dependable in those days. 1930, I don't know, it was 34 or so. And she drove by herself from the yeah. shop in the Bayonne in the evening, I guess. Oh, uh, with you. Okay, the other memory I have which ties into that is feeling lost and looking for my mother, and all I see are black dresses. No, because I'm about that height now. Mm -hmm. About halfway up on the average of his leg. Mm -hmm. And I panicked. I was crying and crying. And finally my mother kicked me up. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, when we first got here, Mary had got roses. And she'd say, oh, smell these roses. How nice they smell. And I'd say, ah, oh, smells like a funeral. It reminds me of a funeral. And every time somebody said something about flowers or ask me to smell them, I'd say, oh, it reminds me of a funeral. And then I started thinking, how many funerals have I been to? <coughs> My other grandfather died when I was 14, and I don't remember any flowers, any flowers <coughs> when my parents died. I don't remember any flowers as such, you know. So I think it goes back to my grandfather's, my mother's father's funeral. And I was so scared, and there were flowers, and mm. I associate that flowers with the funeral, and so every time I smell flowers, I tend to smell like a funeral. Hmm. Now, maybe there's no sense to that, but uh, I don't know where I got this idea that flowers smell like a funeral. Yeah, it's up here, because I've never been to that many funerals, and uh, <coughs> it certainly isn't true. Now I, now I like the smell of flowers. Hmm. Now, what do you remember about your mother's father? Nothing. He was died when I was two years old. That's right. That's what you just said. Yeah. Okay. So two. What do you What do you know about who he was, or or what he did from your from your mother or from your uh, he, he aunts drank and uncles? A lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, uh, so that tank that we just you just pointed showed me earlier could have been very well been a yeah, still could have been part of a still equipment. And he worked on a tugboat in New York City <laughs> Harbor. And I guess he fell down, hit his head, and died. That's why he died suddenly. 
And then my dad said something to me once about when they were going together, he took uh, my mother's father, his future father-in-law, to work and he had to help him down the steps to get into the tugboat because he used to take so much. And then both of his sons, my two uncles, my mother's two brothers, both drank a lot. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call them alcoholics, but they drank too much. Mm -hmm. Too much. And, uh, the weakness runs in families. Yeah, definitely does. Yeah. Anything else that you know about him? That's all I remember about him. Okay, we have that one picture with him and the family. That was my that's father. That's my father's. That's your father's, right? Oh, so we don't have a picture of. No. Your mother's His name was John. Uh, his, uh, <coughs> the oldest son of the family was John Jr. And he died during the influenza epidemic in 1918. I think there's another son. And my uncle Eddie was Edward John. So his middle name was after his father. And my uncle Eddie was like an older brother to me. When he was a kid, he lived on the farm. All summer, you know, we played all the time. And so I named one of my sons John Edward. And kind of in memory of uh -huh. my Uncle Eddie. Uh -huh. uh, because he was meant so much to me at that time. And and what were the all the children in that family? The oldest son was John. Yeah. And then there's a picture of, of the six ones that lived uh <coughs> May. My mother, Estelle, Estelle, Sophie, then I think Stanley, and then uh, Steffi, and Eddie. Two boys and six girls. Mm -hmm. Four girls. Sorry. <coughs> On my mother's side. And your mother's mother, do you remember her? Yeah. Uh, she was about five by five. <laughs> Very jolly. And she'd hug me. Oh, my Akahane, Jody, Juni. They called me Juni. And she'd smother me in these mammoth mammaries I couldn't read. <laughs> <laughs> but she was funny. She, she was a joker. At one time, I think again, this is when my grandfather, my father's father died. We lived in her apartment for quite a while. And my folks were gone most of the day. And she was there and... Uh, they had a television, this was 46, 37 maybe, and they had a little square, about eight inches square, black and white. A little <laughs> bitty thing yeah. like that. And uh, that was broadcast out of New York City. 46? And uh, that was the first time I saw a television. Yeah. And somebody <coughs> left an umbrella in the house, and I left it up and I was playing with it. My grandmother's having a fit. Oh, Judy, I don't know, put the umbrella down. Put it down. It's a superstition. You don't open an umbrella in the house. And the other thing I remember too is she'd talk, she'd be talking to herself. And I'd be playing something in the living room, she'd be in the kitchen. And once in a while I'd hear her say, Soma Beach. <laughs> and I don't think anybody ever told her that's not a nice thing for their old grandmother to say. Hmm. <laughs> so she'd be that's doing funny. something here, Soma Beach. How old was what? she, Joe? Cat, like, she was in the 50s, 60s. And then she was young for a grandmother. <laughs> for a grandmother? I don't know. You mm. know I, all I've written, I just visualize her, her face, very fat. And what did you say she called you? Junie. Junie. Junie for Junior. Junie, yeah. And my other grandmother called me Junie, too. Tell me about your other grandmother. Your, your fa tell me about your other grandmother, your father's mother. Uh, and her name was? Her name was... Uh, Margaret. Margaret. My mother's mother's name is Martha. And my father's father, there's a picture of him. He's got a head like a billiard ball. So that's the gene I got, that's the gene Joe got, the mm -hmm. baldness. Say that place. again, Joe. He had a head like a billiard ball, that's all I remember. And he had a big bushy mustache. And uh, my Grandma would come up to our house quite a bit during the summer. She was diabetic. Both of my grandmothers were diabetic. And my mother's mother had, uh, I guess, one foot cut off and then the oh ankle. Oh, God. Up at the hip, you know. Mm. And eventually she died. But she was overweight. My father's mother was not overweight. 
Yeah, that's when the shots. It did stay for maybe a month or more at our place, I guess. I don't remember. But uh, one time there's nobody around. Did my uncle Stanley work there, I guess, or my parents. There's no, no adults around to give her incidents out. So she said, Junie, guy give me my shot. <laughs> and I was about 14 or so, I was scared to death. <laughs> Stick a needle in this little old lady. Mm -hmm. And she uh, rubbed alcohol <coughs> in her arm. She got all set up. And she said, go, oh, just stab it. And uh, like this. <laughs> but I jabbed it, I squeezed it. It's okay. She said, okay. Maybe she was... Riley with pain inside, but she had a smile, smile on her face. And she said, see, nothing to it. Hmm. Uh, and she was very nice, but you know, my grandparents didn't talk English very much, so I, I didn't have much of a relationship with them. So I'm glad but, you kids had a better relationship <coughs> with your grandparents. But you would go to see them then, once a year or so? Or what? Oh, yeah, I don't know, from time to time, maybe go down there. <coughs> Uh, one time during the war, meat was rationed, among other things. We raised pigs. <coughs> and so we uh, butchered a pig, <coughs> and we took a half down to relatives in Pennsylvania. In the back of that station wagon I was talking about, <coughs> parents sat up front, then me. <coughs> this was in February when it was cold. And uh, I don't know why I wasn't in school. Maybe it was a break dinner or something. Well, it took about a week, and my dad said, if anybody stops us, we're just taking this pig to give to our relatives. Of course, they were going to sell it. And I don't know just who they gave it to. I guess they gave it to somebody who knew a butcher, and they cut up to half a pig for meat, because meat was, wasn't that easy to come by. No, it was rationed. You only allowed so much a week. Yeah. But nobody stopped you? Yes. Nobody stopped you on the way? Hmm? Nobody I'm stopped not, you on the way? I got a, a side question on that then. Where did you keep the pigs when you when you raised them? Do you remember that? In the barn. The barn that was the called the barn? The, barn? the, the yeah. garage? Yeah. Okay, then there's a pig pen there. <coughs> then we uh, fenced it all. <coughs> and they run around in there. I think we usually had two. Uh, and one year we raised, what the heck is that product? Was this at your parents' house you're talking yeah. about? Right across the road from the house, yeah, right across the house. We raised a plant that you get canola oil from. Rapeseed? Rapeseed? Rape, yeah. Yeah, rape. Rape. Mm -hmm. And that stuff, that had an awful smell. And, you know, we'd have the door open in the summer and you get that smell coming in the house. But when the plants got so big, we let the pigs in there and they should love it and they just ate a lot of that. Hmm. Hmm. Canola oil doesn't smell at all, that's why no. I use it. Yeah, but that, the plant smells. It really? Yeah, terrible smell. What kind of a plant is it, Joe? What is it? Oh, uh, I, I don't know. Go about it. Is it considered a, a, a weed? I mean, a green? Well, or, know, is it green because, uh, or what? It's, well, if you're, it's a crop if you get canola oil from But the it doesn't thing. come like a bean or a crop? Cro uh, 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 like I don't know. Like a spinach? <coughs> the rape. Type? The rape, is it, is it more like, does it look like wheat? Or is it tall, grassy? It's about a foot and a half high. It looks like spinach, in other words. I don't remember that. <coughs> in the 1940s. So, so um, your father's father, what did he do for work? Hmm? What did he do for work, your father's father? He worked at, at that time at Standard Oil, which is the, where the Rockefeller money came from. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So our business, and then it became Esso, then it became Exxon. Remember Esso? What did he do? I don't know, just a laborer, I guess. In the in the in the, in the refinery? I don't know. Okay, but My since Dad never told me, I asked him once what he did. He just said he worked for Standard Oil. <coughs> yeah, so I'm not just a laborer, whatever they needed laborers for. Mm -hmm. And then. Um, just to dig back a little bit, do you know anything about the generation before them? Those your four grandparents. Do you know anything about the generation before your four grandparents? We know we know a few names from. I uh, think maybe from research, but about who they are or what kind of your great stories that were told. In other words, his great grandparents, <laughs> right? Right. My mother said her parents had money, 
Europe, and that they traveled back and forth to Europe by boat. She went, she was a little baby, she doesn't remember anything about it. Your mother went? She went twice, yeah, huh? back to Poland. They, must have, they had a fair amount of money to travel by boat twice. Uh, they were called Rusopolskis, I think, which... I thought Poland bordered Russia, but it doesn't. There's uh, the Ukraine in there, I believe. But anyway, there's, uh, there's some relationship there, I guess. There Rusopolsky. So, well, the Rus is a, is a, di a different people from there. many of the Rus is a particular people that actually were, I think, originally Norse. I don't know they were called. Oh, that's, that's about all I know different. there. Rusopolsky and uh, <coughs> my father's family, came, I think, came from an area where they uh, coal mining, mm -hmm. and, his, and my grandmother's father was something comparable to a sheriff in their community. And uh, he had three wives. His first wife died. My grandmother was born to a second wife. She died. And then he married a girl that was about the age of my grandmother, who was 18 or so at the time. And he brought her in the house, you know, in very domineering, very rigid type structure in the family. He said, you will call her mother. You will treat her with respect. She is your mother. Woman the same age as my grandmother. So she said, I'm not going to put up with this. So that's why she left. For your grandmother? My, my father's mother. That's why she came to this country. I think. And, uh, Her name was Maka? My father's father, I came, came to escape the draft. It was very rough in those countries, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, why my mother's parents came over here, I don't know. They all came basically for a better life. Mm -hmm. and so I think of that when I hear all this trouble about the Mexicans and the Central Arizona, Central Americans immigrating here. Yeah, they, they, there are some with drugs and some criminals and so on, but most of them just want a better life and ease of living. Mm hmm absolutely. They want a better life for their children. Mm hmm Do you remember any of your great-grandparents, Joe? Great-grandparents, I never knew them. They were over in Poland. They never came None of them ever, came, never ever. came here. No, I don't know anything about them. Let's see, and then... Uh, they never talk much about that. Yeah. They were Americans. No, they weren't greenhorns. Greenhorn just got off the boat. That was the expression. And your father's family, he was the only only boy. The only boy, he yeah. had uh, <coughs> eight or nine sisters. Do you remember the order of the sisters? Really? A lot of sisters? Yeah. Do you remember the order of the na yeah. names and the order of the sisters? Uh... Steffi was the oldest. <coughs> Sister Gemma, who was Julia, she became a nun. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was on your grandma's side. No, on my father's side. Okay. Mary and Bertha was the youngest. And my dad was in there. I said, we got a picture of them. Yeah. I think we have the, the, the names on them, too. Yeah, I think uh, Mary Ann, <coughs> my cousin, I think yeah. we, we figured it out one time. We pretty much figured it out. But they are wrote it down on that mm -hmm. picture. But, you know, when, when we get into uh, genetics and biology, I never did much of this, but if you <coughs> figure out the odds of one child out of eight being uh, one sex and all the other seven Another sex, the chance of that happening by chance alone is extremely small. And there are family, there were the Tabalts. Remember them, Beaver Falls? There Very were, good. I think, eight boys, they finally had a girl. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just due to chance alone, then. There's something about perhaps the environment of the uterus or something that's the X and the Y sperm are very different. And there's so. For some reason, maybe only one sperm will reach the egg to fertilize it. So there's other things involved if you see something, a family has just a lot of one sex. It's not due to chance. It's due to something else, and it's probably not much research on it because uh, it's not a defect or anything. <coughs> and people aren't that, nobody's ready to spend money on that kind of research. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's quite interesting. I have friends, they have six boys. She said, I'm not going to have another football team to get that girl. 
Mm. This is the McGuffey's. I don't think you've ever met no. them. <laughs> no, we always thought it was interesting that, that um, our cousins, since we didn't have any cousins on your side, or first first cousins, our cousins were on my mother's side, and and there was one family of three boys and one family of three girls, and then you were mixed, the Bancos and the Carters. Yeah. <laughs> I remember you said something about that once. That brought up, somebody brought that up in, um, about yeah, one of those families. had three boys. Yeah. Who did? Uh, Anna May's older, younger sister, Regina, has three boys. Regina? And then her brother has three girls. Really? <coughs> That's all they have, three kids, Anna May, Regina, and her brother, right? Yeah. And somebody, one of the family said something about them because they didn't have, maybe maybe it was the family with girls, the Bancos not having sons, being being green with envy, envy. And somebody said to you, you're not green with envy, are you, Dad? And you said, I'm not even green. I said that? Mm-hmm. I remember that. I remember that coming. Mm -hmm. You had some of these, so, so you were lucky. Yeah. But you didn't have any brothers or sisters. No, I was only Did you? spoiled brat. Hmm? Spoiled brat. Did you wish you had some? Oh, yes. Oh, very much so. Me too. <coughs> we had our last family reunion. You know, you guys are hitting each other. You know, talking about when you were young and going on like this. And I saw myself feeling a little envious. That I don't, I would never have had to experience this. I, this is what I'm being envious of my children. But you've got something that I don't ever have. <coughs> very into the child you never had either. Mm -hmm. This camaraderie with your siblings, and yet there are siblings that don't get along at all. Thank God, we are close. You're close. We're close. Thanks to Evie. Except for geography. Hmm? Except for geography. Yeah. We're close. Thanks to Evie, you go back and forth all the time. I remember once being at the the Stanix, and the Stanix is what we called your parents in, in that place. It was always very excited to go to the, the Stanix for this, usually in the summer. And uh, <clears throat> I got sick. You got sick? I got sick with something, probably a flu or a cold or so, and I had to stay in bed. But I was in Georgie's room, mm -hmm. what, used to, what we called Georgie's room. Mm -hmm. And you came in once to check on me and, and uh, see how I was and make me feel better and who's, explain what, to me. Who's Georgie, by the way? <coughs> He's the head man who lived with us. That was the one you told me about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a lot but, of the times you went there, uh, the first two or three once we moved to uh, Lewis County. I went to school during the summer. Mm -hmm. So that's why you spent some time with the one parent, the one grandparent, some with the other. Mm -hmm. So we sponge off your parents. Yeah, so quite some, uh, several weeks then we'd be there, right? Okay, I can tell about so, Georgie. Uh, I said my uncle Stanley stayed with us and worked until 1940 and the war was coming on. So he joined the Air, Army Air Corps. He thought that would be better off than waiting to be drafted and probably end up in the infantry. And it was. He spent the war in uh, England. He was an airplane mechanic. But it was safe, you know. There wasn't any battle scenes or anything. So they hired, uh, I remember again, <laughs> I go on and on here, <coughs> going with my parents to the priest's house, and I think they're going to s see if he knew of anybody they might get for a hired man. It was something like this. And the priest was Father Monahan. He was very nice. He smoked a pipe. They went to the priest's big house. And here's this fireplace and all this nice fancy furniture that I had never seen before. And I thought, boy, a priest lives like this, you know. It's really impressive, I don't know. <coughs> Ten years old or so. <coughs> How about the priest look? I don't, but we went there for some reason. And uh, Georgie went to a hoopany, his parents lived in a hoopany. <coughs> and the hoopany had school up to 11th grade. <laughs> And then if they wanted to finish high school, they went to Tunkhannock and they boarded out there during the week. Well. And Georgie did he graduate high school. A lot of his classmates didn't bother doing that. 
And uh, so <coughs> we looked for somebody and we got him. I, I'm not sure just how. And uh, <coughs> he might be called today slow or, I don't know, some low IQ, something like that, you know. Not too bright. But he was very dependable. Who's this, the hired man? <coughs> yeah, the hired man. And they did a lot of work at night, you know. As we go, uh, when the chickens had to come in from the uh, shelters on the range and put in the pens, we did that all after dark because they all on roost. And you go in, you grab a, two hands full of the legs, stuff them in the coops, go to the coops in the station wagon, drive it up to the chicken house, wherever they're going in, or up to the pen, take them out and unload them. You had to transfer them huh? twice? You had to transfer them twice a day? No, we, we transferred them. It was, well, it's a permanent transfer because they, oh. they were pullets now. They're ready to lay eggs. They were, in fact, we'd find eggs out of range. That was my job to look around and look for eggs. And then we'd, we'd move them in there. And uh, we do that in the fall. You hope you got done before the weather got bad or snowed or something. But George, he did that. He worked in the evening after supper. There's something to do. Mm -hmm. He would do that. It was never one, once a season, Joe, or are you mm -hmm. saying every week? Once a season? Once a season in the fall. Yeah. And then the other thing we have sometimes, when you first put them out in the spring, it got cold. They'd crowd together and smother. And George and I used to go and try to separate them and then put them up on the perches. The perches, sometimes we'd lose 10 or more. Mm. That's a big loss. And now, it's, uh, everything is done inside. It's all mechanical. Yeah, that was all labor intensive. All farming then was labor intensive, and now it's uh, all mechanized. But the eggs are much better when they're yeah. when they run around. So, speaking of, of of that and the eggs and the roost, <coughs> once you told us that you got you had to go through and close all the roosts. Purchase. The purchase. Close the purchase. And oh, by yourself, and it was very scary. And uh, you were doing you were, or something about a ghost story, or yeah, or well, the <coughs> in front of the nest, so the birds hop up on there. And the nest we had, the nest would be usually three years high. <coughs> and then after we made the last pickup of eggs, which I think was around three thirty or four, we then put those perches up. Otherwise, they'd go in there and sleep and poop all over the nest, and then the egg, the eggs would get dirty. Mm -hmm. So then after dark, when the birds are on the roof sleeping, you got to go back in there and pull them down every night. And uh, the chicken house, you remember, Bill, were scattered. Mm -hmm. And they were built in the 1920s, and the idea then was to keep them separate. So if you had a disease, because diseases were always a problem, if you had disease in one, it wouldn't spread to the other. Mm -hmm. Well, that never worked because you carried manure on your shoes, and that's how you transported the diseases. Mm -hmm. Then finally we got to the point where you'd step in the pans with dis disinfectant, and I don't know how effective that was. Mm -hmm. But the one was ba back in the woods. Number six, right? No, that was number four. Number four. There wasn't really a number six, except the uh, Bruder House was for the number six. But okay. Usually it was called the Bruder House. <coughs> so I walked down there at night, mm -hmm. like Were you scared? Purses. Were you scared? I was uh, occasionally, yeah, when I was younger, and Georgie often did that, but uh, I, Georgie got one one Sunday off every other week. <coughs> one Sunday off every other week? Yeah. So he worked for 13 days and had a day off? Mm-hmm. Okay. But That's what hired men did. A lot of dairy farmers had hired men that would do that sort of thing. So this one particular time you got real scared and ran through it real quick? Yeah, I, I was always kind of nervous, I guess, about going on there, especially if, if the moon was shining through the trees. <laughs> Real spooky, huh? Yeah. And so you do it in a hurry. So why that... Did, why didn't, excuse me, why didn't your father go with you? I was a big boy. I was 11 or 12. Or maybe he was working. Oh, well, that was my job. My father didn't do that. That's either Georgie or me. So that one time I was sick in that room there, we always call, always call it Georgie's room. Yes. You knew it to be there, and it was the one, you sort of walk in a, in a long hall that's about 10 feet or so narrow, and then it opens up for the bed. And you came in and told me that that had been your room when you were a boy. 
Oh, well, that was upstairs. Then. Upstairs, yeah. Yeah, that was my room when I was a boy, yeah. That was a Georgie's room. It never was Georgie's room? Well, maybe it was actually. I moved out. Yeah, I think so, because so we called it that. The bed <laughs> just fit in there. Yeah, just barely. Yeah. And you told me that you would lived up there. That was your room, and you had a little shelf with an AM radio that you listened to baseball games, and you had a pennant on the wall. Yeah. And I had my tonsils out. My parents bought me a radio. Ah. So I had a little shelf there, and I could listen to that at night. How old were you? I'd read. Hmm? How old were you when your tonsils were out? Thirteen or so, maybe. Mm. Was that the house that I was in? In the shop? Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, well, we went there, a little couple from Massachusetts, remember them? But they never took us in the house upstairs. I guess they had the family living up there. You went there before Grandma moved out, though. Yeah, oh, I yeah, you went to one time before. When she was getting yeah. ready to move out. I don't know if you went, you, did you go upstairs? Probably go upstairs. I think so. Yeah. It was a big, long hallway with light wood, for, light wood on the walls. Yeah. I remember that was like real modern for a farmhouse. It was upstairs. Light paneling, yeah. Yeah, light, pa light wood, light paneling. Yeah, I was yeah, there. Right were we already married or were we? We no, weren't married no. yet, were we? No, we were going down because my mother was selling. We were married when your mother <laughs> sold the house. No, we weren't married then. No. I was living in Scranton and came up with my mother. And that's the first time you met her. So I remember that, and you two hugged. Didn't oh. you, sort of. Okay, I'll tell you another story about mm -hmm. this. Now, then hold up. Remember the top of the stairs of the hallway? There was a switch, light switch. The push button one. The, uh, the push button was on the bottom. Oh. But on top it was uh, like a gold-plated globe. I never saw anyone like that. It probably was uh, not up to any cold, but they didn't have any cold then. And it had a very loud click. Yes, and you turned to the right and it clicked. Yeah. Yes. Turned off or on, but clicked. Yeah. So when I was older and I had my driver's license, I'd come home late. And uh, <coughs> the hallway was perfectly dark, black, so I put the light on at the bottom. And then I got to the top of the stairs, I would click that light, and I could hear my mother roll over, and she'd look at her clock. Mm. And the next morning she'd say, what time did you get in last night? I'd say, oh, about 11. She said, it was not, it was 1.30. <laughs> mm. So being a smart-ass teenager, I'd say, oh, if you know, why'd you ask me? Oh, she, she'd do that every time. She'd hear that click. She must have been waiting for it. Yeah. Half so, asleep, half asleep, but waiting for it. So when you were a teenager, what did you do in the evenings? Hmm? What did you do in the evenings when you were a teenager then? Oh, we stayed home, listened to the radio quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. When you went out, that's what the fourth, did you do? That's the third that, lie. Okay, that's that's it. <coughs> no, what'd you do? Hmm? What'd you do when you were a teenager? Oh, when I went out with your mother quite a bit. Mm-hmm. I didn't go out much. Uh, roller skating Saturday nights, that was a big thing. I'd go roller skating in Tunkhannock. <laughs> did you, re did you uh, go through a rebellious phase? The what? Did you go through a re rebellious phase? Not terribly, I don't think. Maybe internally, but not, not to my parents. You weren't allowed to, Bill. Mm -hmm. We weren't allowed to be like that. Well, I see if you do it internally, you're sort of, you know, what, I know, what does that mean? To... Doing stuff that you're not supposed to do and trying to get away with it. I, I don't you? remember that. I mean, you know, being at home, uh, you know, friends, so you associate very How old were you when you started going with anime? <laughs> oh, 19, 18. So you were a little past the teenage stage. Yeah, I was the first. That's my first year in college. Okay. Met that what summer. did you do before younger years of teenage? <coughs> I went roller skating quite a bit. There was a dance we went to once in a while. I guess. Who's we? Who's we? We, uh, my friends and I. Okay. And uh, I remember hitchhiking. I go roller skating. I think Georgie and I did that a couple of times. Hmm. You walk out to the highway, which is a mile walk. You stick your thumbs out, and somebody recognizes <coughs> I guess in the Tunkhannock. I hitchhiked from college a couple of times. It's a, really? about a four-hour drive. If you're driving into car all the time. And it was okay hitchhiking. You get you get rides. Yeah, it was safer than Bill. Yeah. 
It was, wasn't it, Jack? It was <laughs> safe. safe. Not, not today. I no, would. not today. So, tell me about the girlfriends you had before you, you got married. I really didn't have any. Well, who did you fool around with, Joe, you know, in high school? Huh? Who did you fool around <laughs> with in high school? Nobody, really. You were gay? No. <laughs> No, I don't know. Just didn't they didn't know have that much. back then. Uh, yes, they did. I you was know, skated with girls at the roller skating place. <coughs> never went steady with anybody, anything like that. Never got serious. I was out of college, they, you know, ever since I can remember. That was understood, just like the thought. You got to come up in the morning. You're going to go to college. Mm -hmm. What was college like for you? First year was very rough. The school I went to was. Uh, to about 200 kids from first grade to 12th grade, same building. And I got to college, and there were about 10,000 students and 10,000 kids. That's a big <coughs> jump. Mm -hmm. And when I got in the classes, I realized I was, I had a very poor high school education. And uh, I've always been kind of bitter about that, I think. <coughs> Didn't learn anything. Oh, the math teacher was the only one who could uh, control control students, didn't have a discipline problem to speak of. And the same teacher taught me, I think probably seventh grade English, eighth grade history, biology, chemistry, and physics. Mm. She's a hormone teacher. And they said, there's lab equipment around, you know. I said, are we going to do anything with this lab equipment? Aren't we going to have any experiments? She said, well, there are too many people. We can't do that. Mm. And most of the kids, 25 in my high school class, most of them are in the FFA or FHA. Mm -hmm. And there were two, maybe two or three that took the business program. And I took an academic course. I was the only one. And uh, the math program ended. I think the last math course was geometry, 11th grade. And I asked the math teacher, would she teach, would be the trig? She said, yeah, well, if you could get four other people, or three other people, so the class of four, I'll teach it. So I went around, the only kids I knew in 11th and 12th grade, you know, that was smart. They want to take a trig course. Nobody would. Mm. Nobody would. And uh, when and the, the chemistry, there are problems at the end of a, a certain chapter. I'll never forget this either. And the teacher said, well, if you're not going to college, you don't have to bother doing trying to do these. So I tried to do it, and I couldn't. And I had to go up there and ask her help. She was a homo teacher. And she had to fiddle around, and then she'd tell somebody, be quiet, stop talking. And it soon became obvious to me that she didn't know how to do it either. Mm -hmm. So I got to college about the third week of freshman chemistry. There are these problems again. Mm. Ironically, some about 15 or so years later, I find myself in Beaver Falls teaching chemistry, and that's when I learned those problems. That's when you learn. So if you want to learn something, teach it. <laughs> no kidding. You have to. You think you know it until you've got to explain it to other people. Mm -hmm. I'm getting thirsty and hungry. You want ice cream? Yeah. I didn't know that you liked ice cream. Hmm? I didn't know that you liked ice cream. Oh, he's crazy about it, Bill. Do you? Yeah, I know. It's a, it's a family deficiency, I guess, or something. Family deficiency. We used to uh, work hard to persuade you to drive us to Schwendy's and then Schultz's yeah. to get ice cream. We'd have to yeah. get dig out our allowances out of the 35 cents a week that we got. Oh, I paid for it. I wasn't that cheap. No, not all the time. I didn't? Yes, not all the time. Huh? You would have us pay for our own ice cream most of the time, oh, I boy, think. Oh, I was pretty tough then, huh? You were, yeah. <laughs> but uh, we'd make well, it you learned the value of a nickel then, huh? And the value of ice cream. <laughs> you learned that a nickel doesn't buy much. Yeah. We learned the value of ice cream, too. <laughs>